After Chief Inspector Heat had left him, Mr. Verloc moved about the parlor. From time to time, he eyed his wife through the open door. She knows all about it, now he thought to himself, with commiseration for her sorrow and with some satisfaction as regarded himself. Mr. Verloc's soul, if lacking graceness, perhaps, was capable of tender sentiments. The prospects of having to break the news to her had put him into a fever. Chief Inspector Heat had relieved him of that task. That was good as far as it went. It remained for him now to face her grief. Mr. Verloc had never expected to have it on account of death, whose catastrophic character cannot be argued away by sophisticated reasoning or persuasive eloquence. Mr. Verloc never meant Stevie to perish with such abrupt violence. He did not mean him to perish at all. Stevie dead was a much greater nuisance than ever he had been when alive. Mr. Verloc had augured a favorable issue to his enterprise, basing himself not on Stevie's intelligence, which sometimes plays queer tricks with a man, but on the blind docility and on the blind devotion of the boy. Though not much of a psychologist, Mr. Verloc had gauged the depths of Stevie's fanaticism. He dared cherish the hope of Stevie walking away from the walls of the observatory, as he had been instructed to do, taking the way shown to him several times previously, and rejoining his brother-in-law, the wise and good Mr. Verloc, outside the precincts of the park. Fifteen minutes ought to have been enough for the veriest fool to deposit the engine and walk away and the professor had guaranteed more than 15 minutes. But Stevie had stumbled within five minutes of being left to himself, and Mr. Verloc was shaken morally to pieces. He had foreseen anything but that. He had foreseen Stevie distracted and lost, sought for, found in some police station or a provincial workhouse in the end. He had foreseen Stevie arrested and was not afraid, because Mr. Verloc had a great opinion of Stevie's loyalty, which had been carefully indoctrinated with the necessity of silence in the course of many walks. Like a peripatetic philosopher, Mr. Verloc, strolling along the streets of London, had modified Stevie's view of the police by conversations full of subtle reasonings. Never had a sage a more attentive and admiring disciple. The submission and worship were so apparent that Mr. Verloc had come to feel something like a liking for the boy. In any case, he had not foreseen the swift bringing home of his connection, that his wife should hit upon the precaution of sewing the boy's address inside his overcoat was the last thing Mr. Verloc would have thought of. One can't think of everything. That was what she meant when she said that he need not worry if he lost Stevie during their walks. She had assured him that the boy would turn up all right. Well, he had turned up with a vengeance. Well, well, muttered Mr. Verloc in his wonder. What did she mean by it? Spare him the trouble of keeping an anxious eye on Stevie. Most likely she had meant well, only she ought to have told him of the precaution she had taken. Mr. Verloc walked behind the counter of the shop. His intention was not to overwhelm his wife with bitter reproaches. Mr. Verloc felt no bitterness. The unexpected march of events had converted him to the doctrine of fatalism. Nothing could be helped now. He said, I didn't mean any harm to come to the boy. Mrs. Verloc shuddered at the sound of her husband's voice. She did not uncover her face. The trusted secret agent of the late Baron Stott Wartenheim looked 
at her for a time with a heavy, persistent, undiscerning glance. The torn evening paper was lying at her feet. It could not have told her much. Mr. Verloc felt the need of talking to his wife. It's that damned heat, eh, he said. He upset you. He's a brute, blurting it out like this to a woman. I made myself ill thinking how to break it to you. I sat for hours in the little parlor of Cheshire Cheese, thinking over the best way. I understand you never meant any harm to come to that boy. Mr. Verloc, the secret agent, was speaking the truth. It was his marital affection that had received the greatest shock from the premature explosion. He added, I didn't feel particularly gay sitting there and thinking of you. He observed another slight shudder of his wife, which affected his sensibility. As she persisted in hiding her face in her hands, he thought he had better leave her alone for a while. On this delicate impulse, Mr. Verloc withdrew into the parlor again, where the gas jet purred like a contented cat. Mrs. Verloc's wifely forethought had left the cold beef on the table with a carving knife and fork and half a loaf of bread for Mr. Verloc's supper. He noticed all these things now for the first time, and cutting himself a piece of bread and meat began to eat it. His appetite did not proceed from callousness. Mr. Verloc had not eaten any breakfast that day. He had left his home fasting. Not being an energetic man, he found his resolution a nervous excitement, which seemed to hold him mainly by the throat. He could not have swallowed anything solid. Michaelis's cottage was as destitute of provisions as the cell of a prisoner. The ticket of leave apostle lived on a little milk and crusts of stale bread. Moreover, when Mr. Verloc arrived, he had already gone upstairs after his frugal meal, absorbed in the toil and delight of literary composition. He had not even answered Mr. Verloc's shout up the little staircase. I am taking this young fellow home for a day or two. And in truth, Mr. Verloc did not wait for an answer but had marched out of the cottage at once, followed by the obedient Stevie. Now that all action was over and his fate taken out of his hands with unexpected swiftness, Mr. Verloc felt terribly empty physically. He carved the meat, cut the bread, and devoured his supper standing by the table, and now and then casting a glance towards his wife. Her prolonged immobility disturbed the comfort of his reflection. He walked again into the shop and came up very close to her. This sorrow with a veiled face made Mr. Verloc uneasy. He expected, of course, his wife to be very much upset, but he wanted her to pull herself together. He needed all her assistance and all her loyalty in these new conjunctures his fatalism had already accepted. Can't be helped, he said in a tone of gloomy sympathy. Come, Winnie, we've got to think of tomorrow. You'll want all your wits about you after I am taken away. He paused. Mrs. Verloc's breast heaved convulsively. This was not reassuring to Mr. Verloc, in whose view the newly created situation required from the two people most concerned in it, calmness, decision, and other qualities incapable with the mental disorder of passionate sorrow. Mr. Verloc was a humane man. He had come home prepared to allow every latitude to his wife's affection for her brother. Only he did not understand either the nature or the whole extent of that sentiment and in this he was excusable, since it was impossible for him to understand it without ceasing to be himself. He was startled and disappointed, and his speech conveyed it by a certain roughness of tone. 
You might look at a fellow, he observed after waiting a while, as if forced through the hands covering Mrs. Verloc's face, the answer came, deadened, almost pitiful. I don't want to look at you as long as I live. Eh? What? Mr. Verloc was merely startled by the superficial and literal meaning of this declaration. It was obviously unreasonable, the mere cry of exaggerated grief. He threw over it the mantle of his marital indulgence. The mind of Mr. Verloc lacked profundity. Under the mistaken impression that the value of individuals consists in what they are in themselves, he could not possibly comprehend the value of Stevie in the eyes of Mrs. Verloc. She was taking it confoundedly hard, he thought to himself. It was all the fault of that damned heat. What did he want to upset the woman for? But she mustn't be allowed, for her own good, to carry on so till she got quite beside herself. Look here, you can't sit like this in the shop, he said, with affected severity, in which there was some real annoyance, for urgent practical matters must be talked over if they had to sit up all night. Somebody might come in at any minute, he added, and waited again. No effect was produced, and the idea of the finality of death occurred to Mr. Verloc during the pause. He changed his tone. Come, this won't bring him back, he said gently, feeling ready to take her in his arms and press her to his breast, where impatience and compassion dwelt side by side. But except for a short shudder, Mrs. Verloc remained apparently unaffected by the force of that terrible truism. It was Mr. Verloc himself who was moved. He was moved in his simplicity to urge moderation by asserting the claims of his own personality. Do be reasonable, Winnie. What would it have been if you had lost me? He had vaguely expected her to cry out, but she did not budge. She leaned back a little, quieted down to a complete, unreadable stillness. Mr. Verloc's heart began to beat faster, with exasperation and something resembling alarm. He laid his hand on her shoulder, saying, Don't be a fool, Winnie. She gave no sign. It was impossible to talk to any purpose with a woman whose face one cannot see. Mr. Verloc caught hold of his wife's wrists, but her hands seemed glued fast. She swayed forward bodily to his tug and nearly went off the chair. Startled to feel her so helplessly limp, he was trying to put her back on the chair when she stiffened suddenly all over, tore herself out of his hands, and ran out of the shop, across the parlor, and into the kitchen. This was very swift. He had just a glimpse of her face, and that much of her eyes, that he knew she had not looked at him. It all had the appearance of a struggle for the possession of a chair, because Mr. Verloc instantly took his wife's place in it. Mr. Verloc did not cover his face with his hands, but a somber thoughtfulness veiled his features. A term of imprisonment could not be avoided. He did not wish now to avoid it. A prison was a place as safe from certain unlawful vengeances as the grave, with this advantage that in a prison there is room for hope. What he saw before him was a term of imprisonment, an early release, and then life abroad somewhere, such as he had contemplated already, in case of failure. Well, it was a failure, if not exactly the sort of failure he had feared. It had been so near success that he could have positively terrified Mr. Vladimir out of his ferocious scoffing with this proof of occult efficiency. So at least it seemed now to Mr. Verloc. His prestige with the embassy would have been immense if, 
if his wife had not had the unlucky notion of sewing on the address inside Stevie's overcoat. Mr. Verloc, who was no fool, had soon perceived the extraordinary character of the influence he had over Stevie, though he did not understand exactly its origin. The doctrine of his supreme wisdom and goodness inculcated by two anxious women. In all the eventual in all the eventualities he had foreseen, Mr. Verloc had calculated with correct insight on Stevie's instinctive loyalty and blind discretion. The eventuality he had not foreseen had appalled him as a human man and a fond husband. From every other point of view, it was rather advantageous. Nothing can equal the everlasting discretion of death. Mr. Verloc, sitting perplexed and frightened in the small parlor of the Cheshire Cheese, could not help acknowledging that to himself, because his sensibility did not stand in the way of his judgment. Stevie's violent disintegration, however disturbing to think about, only assured the success for, of course, the knocking down of a wall was not the aim of Mr. Vladimir's menaces, but the production of a moral effect. With much trouble and distress on Mr. Verloc's part, the effect might be said to have been produced, when, however, most unexpectedly, it came home to roost in Brett Street. Mr. Verloc, who had been struggling like a man in a nightmare for the preservation of his position, accepted the blow in the spirit of a convinced fatalist. The position was gone through. No one's fault, really. A small, tiny fact had done it. It was like slipping on a bit of orange peel in the dark and breaking your leg. Mr. Verloc drew a weary breath. He nourished no resentment against his wife. He thought, she will have to look after the shop while they keep me locked up, and thinking also how cruelly she would miss Stevie at first. He felt greatly concerned about her health and spirits. How would she stand her solitude, absolutely alone in that house? It would not do for her to break down while he was locked up. What would become of the shop then? The shop was an asset. Though Mr. Verloc's fatalism accepted his undoing as a secret agent, he had no mind to be utterly ruined, mostly, it must be owned, from regard for his wife. Silent and out of his line of sight in the kitchen, she frightened him. If only she had had her mother with her. But that silly old woman, an angry dismay, possessed Mr. Verloc. He must talk with his wife. He could tell her certainly that a man does get desperate under certain circumstances, but he did not go incontinently to impart to her that information. First of all, it was clear to him that this evening was no time for business. He got up to close the street door and put the gas out in the shop. Having thus assured of solitude around his hearthstone, Mr. Verloc walked into the parlor and glanced down into the kitchen. Mrs. Verloc was sitting in the place where poor Stevie usually established himself of an evening with paper and pencil for the pastime of drawing these coruscations of innumerable circles suggesting chaos and eternity. Her arms were folded on the table and her head was lying on her arms. Mr. Verloc contemplated her back and the arrangement of her hair for a time, then walked away from the kitchen door. Mrs. Verloc's philosophical, almost disdainful incuriosity, the foundation of their accord in domestic life, made it extremely difficult to get into contact with her, now this tragic necessity had arisen. Mr. Verloc felt this difficulty acutely. 
he turned around the table in the parlor with his usual air of large animal in a cage. Curiosity, being one of the forms of self-revelation, a systematically incurious person remains always partly mysterious. Every time he passed near the door, Mr. Verloc glanced at his wife uneasily. It was not that he was afraid of her. Mr. Verloc imagined himself loved by that woman, but she had not accustomed him to make confidences and the confidence he had to make was of a profound psychological order. How, with his want of practice, could he tell her what he himself felt but vaguely, that there are conspiracies of fatal destiny, that a notion grows in a mind, sometimes till it acquires an outward existence, an independent power of its own, and even a suggestive voice? He could not inform her that a man may be haunted by a fat, witty, clean-shaved face till the wildest expedient to get rid of it appears a child of wisdom. On his mental reference to a first secretary of a great embassy, Mr. Verloc stopped in the doorway, and looking down into the kitchen with an angry face and clenched fist, addressed his wife. You don't know what a brute I had to deal with. He started off to make another perambulation of the table. Then, when he had come to the door again, he stopped, glaring in from the height of two steps. A silly, jeering, dangerous brute, with no more sense than, after all these years, a man like me, and I have been playing my head at that game. You didn't know. Quite right, too. What was the good of telling you that I stood the risk of having a knife stuck into me at any time these seven years we've been married? I am not a chap to worry a woman that's fond of me. You had no business to know. Mr. Verloc took another turn round the parlor, fuming. A venomous beast, he began again from the doorway. Drive me out into a ditch to starve for a joke. I could see he thought it was a damned good joke. A man like me. Look here. Some of the highest in the world go to thank me for walking on their two legs to this day. That's the man you've got married to, my girl. He perceived that his wife had sat up. Mrs. Verloc's arms remained lying, stretched on the table. Mr. Verloc watched at her back as if he could read their the effect of his words. There isn't a murdering plot for the last eleven years that I hadn't my finger in at the risk of my life. There's scores of these revolutionists I've sent off with their bombs and their blamed pockets to get themselves caught on the frontier. The old baron knew what I was worth to his country, and here suddenly a swine comes along an ignorant, overbearing swine. Mr. Verloc, stepping slowly down two steps, entered the kitchen, took a tumbler off the dresser, and, holding it in his hand, approached the sink, without looking at his wife. It wasn't the old baron who would have had the wicked folly of getting me to call on him at eleven in the morning. There are two or three in this town that, if they had seen me going in, would have made no bones about knocking me on the head sooner or later. It was a silly, murderous trick to expose for nothing a man like me. Mr. Verloc, turning on the tap above the sink, poured three glasses of water, one after another, down his throat to quench the fires of his indignation. Mr. Vladimir's conduct was like a hot brand which set his internal economy in a blaze. He could not get over the disloyalty of it. This man, who would not work at the usual hard tasks which society sets to its humbler members, had exercised his secret industry with an indefatigable devotion. There was in Mr. Verloc a fund of loyalty, 
He had been loyal to his employers, to the cause of social stability, and to his affections, too, as became apparent when, after standing the tumbler in the sink, he turned about saying, If I hadn't thought of you, I would have taken the bullying brute by the throat and rammed his head into the fireplace. I'd have had more than a match for that pink-faced, smooth-shaved. Mr. Verloc neglected to finish the sentence, as if there could be no doubt of the terminal word. For the first time in his life he was taking that incurious woman into his confidence. The singularity of the event, the force and importance of the personal feelings aroused in the course of this confession drove Stevie's fate clean out of Mr. Verloc's mind. The boy's stuttering existence of fears and indignations, together with the violence of his end, had passed out of Mr. Verloc's mental sight for a time. For that reason, when he looked up, he was startled by the inappropriate character of his wife's stare. It was not a wild stare, and it was not inattentive, but its attention was peculiar and not satisfactory, inasmuch that it seemed concentrated upon some point beyond Mr. Verloc's person. The impression was so strong that Mr. Verloc glanced over his shoulder, there was nothing behind him. There was just the whitewashed wall. The excellent husband of Winnie Verloc saw no writing on the wall. He turned to his wife again, repeating with some emphasis, I would have taken him by the throat, as true as I stand here, if I hadn't thought of you, then I would have half choked the life out of the brute before I let him go and don't you think he would have been anxious to call the police either? He wouldn't have dared. You understand why, don't you? He blinked at his wife knowingly. No, said Mrs. Verloc in an unresonant voice, and without looking at him at all, what are you talking about? A great discouragement, the result of fatigue, came upon Mr. Verloc. He had had a very full day, and his nerves had been tried to the utmost. After a month of maddening worry, ending in an unexpected catastrophe, the storm-tossed spirit of Mr. Verloc longed for repose. His career as a secret agent had come to an end, in a way no one could have foreseen. Only now, perhaps, he could manage to get a night's sleep at last. But looking at his wife, he doubted it. She was taking it very hard. Not at all like herself, he thought. He made an effort to speak. You'll have to pull yourself together, my girl, he said sympathetically. What's done can't be undone. Mrs. Verloc gave a slight start, though not a muscle of her white face moved in the least. Mr. Verloc, who was not looking at her, continued ponderously. You go to bed now. What you want is a good cry. This opinion had nothing to recommend it but the general consent of mankind. It is universally understood that, as if there were nothing more substantial than vapor floating in the sky, every emotion of a woman is bound to end in a shower, and it is very probable that had Stevie died in his bed under her despairing gaze, in her protecting arms, Mrs. Verloc's grief would have found relief in a flood of bitter and pure tears. Mrs. Verloc, in common with other human beings, was provided with a fund of unconscious resignation sufficient to meet the normal manifestation of human destiny without troubling her head about it. She was aware that it did not stand looking into very much. But the lamentable circumstances of Stevie's end, which to Mr. Verloc's mind had only an episodic character as part of a greater disaster, dried her tears at their very source. It was the effect of a white-hot iron drawn across her eyes at the same time 
Her heart, hardened and chilled into a lump of ice, kept her body in an inward shudder, set her features into a frozen contemplative immobility, addressed to a whitewashed wall with no writing on it. The exigencies of Mrs. Verloc's temperament, which, when stripped of its philosophical reserve, was maternal and violent, forced her to roll a series of thoughts in her motionless head. These thoughts were rather imagined than expressed. Mrs. Verloc was a woman of singularly few words, either for public or private use. With the rage and dismay of a betrayed woman, she reviewed the tenor of her life in visions concerned mostly with Stevie's difficult existence from its earliest days. It was a life of single purpose and of a noble unity of inspiration, like those rare lives that have left their mark on the thoughts and feelings of mankind. But the visions of Mrs. Verloc lacked nobility and magnificence. She saw herself putting the boy to bed by the light of a single candle on the deserted top floor of a business house, dark under the roof and scintillating exceedingly with lights and cut glass at the level of the street like a fairy palace, was the only one to be met in Mrs. Verloc's visions. She remembered brushing the boy's hair and tying his pinafores, herself in a pinafore still, the consolations administered to a small and badly scared creature by another creature nearly as small but not quite so badly scared. She had the visions of the blows intercepted, often with her own head, of a door held desperately shut against a man's rage, not for very long, of a poker flung once, not very far, which stilled that peculiar storm and to the dumb and awful silence which followed a thunderclap, and all these scenes of violence came and went, accompanied by the unrefined noise of deep vociferations proceeding from a man wounded in his paternal pride, declaring himself obviously accursed since one of his kids was a slobbering idiot and the other a wicked she-devil. It was of her that this had been said many years ago.